Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for the organizer. Thank you for Professor Dutmer um, for inviting me here. I am doing a job as a uh, discussant to, to uh, and thank you for the paper. This is really terrific. And actually, the three papers uh, talk to one another and constitute a coherent uh, whole. Uh, and before I, I respond to the paper, I uh, was asked by Professor Dietmar to briefly summarize uh, Jing Sun paper, who cannot make it here, but Ed already did a good job in uh, one or two lines to summarize uh, his paper, so it made my job easier because the paper is really interesting and also talk to the other two papers. Um, um, the, <coughs> the, the, the title of the paper is Writing on Dragon's Back, Celebrities, Masters, and Foreign Policy, as Ed uh, told us in the beginning, that his argument is that though there's a lot of hawks and nationalist talks uh, among the leaders, politicians, intellectuals, uh, his argument is that we don't need to take that so seriously because they are just playing a kind of a hypocritical or cynical game in the consumerist culture. And the paper has a lot of interesting ex examples, well-known examples that I'm sure many of you know. For example, Sim, uh, Sima Lan is one of the firebrand nationalist hawks, anti-American leading intellectuals. And, and, and uh, uh, later, people in China find out that his family is uh, in the US and he visited the US all the time. And then he was asked about that and then he very frankly responded by saying that uh, it's quote, it is uh, Jing Sun quoting him saying that opposing America is my job, staying in America is my life. <laughs> and um, another example he quote, uh, a very well-known example is that anti-American girl from Beida in 1998 when Clinton visited Beida and then there was a uh, PKU's uh, girl student who confront Clinton um, in the public forum uh, on CCTV. Uh, she criticized all these human rights violations in, in the U.S. among African minority and U.S. Uh, human rights violations in foreign countries and so on and so forth. And then she attacked and asked Clinton why you have a ground to criticize Chinese uh, human rights record. And then later people find out that, that uh, anti-American girl from Beida actually moved to the U.S. and marry the uh, American and then become an American citizen and, 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 and it is eradicated by many uh, young people in China and things like that. So there's a lot of these kind of examples and he uh, want to make the point that all these uh, nationalist talks and all these hawks and, and they, they say this way, they, uh, uh, they, they establish this kind of gesture a lot because they really believe in this uh, nationalist rhetoric or nationalist idea, but they are just performing. Uh, it, there's a wide market and they can sell books and they can become a popular celebrity. Uh, so, uh, so his argument is that we don't need to take that so seriously. And, and, and Westerners and China watchers from the US and other places take it so seriously and then, uh, then uh, create a kind of image of a China threat, but actually he said that there are a lot that serious, there's a lot much of threat. So my discussion, so I, I'm now shifting from the job of summarizing the paper uh, to my discussion. Let me start with that paper. Of course, he cannot be here, so, uh, so uh, he cannot respond, but, but actually it is also a question that I have or a comment that I have that not only him, but also all of you can think about. Um, definitely that there's a lot of cynicism and a lot of hypocrisy in all this nationalist talk. And, uh, one other example that is not in the paper, but we all know is that there's uh, Western media talking about Xi Jinping's family's uh, foreign assets and, 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 and his sisters, his in-laws and whatever, they're all actually migrated to Western countries. And a lot of Chinese elites are like that. And uh, uh, they're, they're, when they are talking about this rhetoric about the superiority of China model and the uh, declining uh, Western kind of uh, uh, economy and things like that. There's a certain kind of hypocrisy in there because they are moving their money and their families there. So it is true that there's this discrepancy and uh, uh, between the rhetorics and what they really are doing uh, under the surface. Uh, but my question is, uh, do we mean that, does it mean that we really need to don't take the rhetoric seriously? Uh, I think that it is not the case because this rhetoric, being rhetoric, even though the speaker, uh, the, the speakers don't believe genuinely in it, uh, but there is still some can have some material consequence. And 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 uh, in the Chinese saying, it's like uh, you can 
be performing, but the performance can sometimes lead to reality. The jia xi zhen zuo that that is that you are faking it, uh, but to back up your word, you do something to show that you are serious, and then what you do to back up that rhetoric sometimes has material consequence. Uh, uh, and in 2019 now, we are in 2019 now, so it is very difficult for us to think that uh, China's uh, aggressive rhetoric over, for example, South China Sea sovereignty issues is just rhetoric because it's backed up by action. All this island building, um, now they have an aircraft carrier and then moving around and also their rhetoric against uh, uh, Taiwan, for example, in 1995, 1996, uh, during or on the eve of the, uh, of the, the first universal suffrage for the presidential election in Taiwan, there was a missile crisis. So they're shooting missiles across the Taiwan Strait to scare the, the, the uh, Taiwan people. But of course it backfired and then get Lee Hui get elected in a more popular way. Uh, at that time, I believe I, I remember that many people say that oh, oh, the, the, the Chinese side is they are just for the sake of consolidating his power. I mean, uh, Zhang Zemin. So they have to do it. So they may, may not be that serious. But in which respect, it is it has material consequence that uh, China rhetoric against Taiwan is more and more aggressive over the years. And now we see uh, that kind of uh, pressure towards uh, 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 unification or whatever have, have real consequence now. The, the latest discussion is about whether China is interfering with Taiwan election and so on and so forth. So there's a material consequence. So, so far as this rhetoric, no matter they believe in it or not, uh, is backed up by some action. So it has some material consequence and then other players in the region will push back and US will push back and it will really lead to uh, bigger conflicts or escalation. So, uh, so uh, even though we agree that a lot of this talk uh, is not that serious and those people talking about those is not that serious, but in the end of the day that it still carries some kind of a material consequence that we, we at the end of the day we still need to take it seriously. Is my comments or, or question or whatever. Uh, and then it um, um, uh, bring us to a very uh, interesting paper by Professor uh, Jeremy Powtill that uh, the between two orders in the Asia Pacific. There's some interesting point in the paper that I don't think you have time to yeah. talk about it. Uh, for example, uh, between the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, Sino-centric tributary system and the sovereignty system, definitely that uh, the paper did a very good job in capturing the examples that actually there's uh, uh, ambivalence and trivalence and, and about China even at the rhetoric level. Sometimes they talk sovereignty. The Westphalia system, so don't intervene into our internal affairs. So it is a Westphalia system talk, but at the same time they talk like a kind of a um, traditional emperor seeing the triple uh, vessel and, and and things like that. So uh, my question is whether this ambivalence it with is a reflection of um, the Chinese leaders or the uh, the CCP really a lot sure whether they. Uh, lead to posit themselves as a kind of a sovereign state or actually a reviving empire or actually it is the, the, the talk about sovereignty and, uh, and the Westphalia principle of sovereignty and then we are equals uh, is just a kind of um, strategic or tactical talk uh, when they think that they are not yet ready to become an empire again or that uh, agenda of uh, rebuilding an empire or tributary system is always uh, um, behind the scene, uh, even though the, they might not say so in the beginning when they feel that they are weak, because um, uh, I have some com interesting conversation with some uh, China historians and studying the history of Chinese nationalism. I, uh, I, I asked the question, this is a few years back, that is around the Olympics, 2008, that uh, what, 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 what is the main theme of Chinese nationalism or nationalist aspiration? as it is uh, now very much reflected in Xi Jinping talk about uh, the great power rejuvenation and reviving. So there's a huge sense of reviving what China has lost uh, since the Opium War. So what China has lost is not only physical territory under its uh, 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 now the nation state's um, uh, territorial space, but also the Sinocentric tributary system that uh, the sense of uh, what China lost is not only it's like Taiwan or, or other piece of uh, lands that they think that it belongs to China, but taken 
a way not yet reunified, but also the traditional tributary trade system that 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 uh, that Western imperialism came and then uh, 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 shattered it, and then uh, so it is part of the re rejuvenation um, um, idea. And uh, in terms of the South China Sea, that people debate whether they are care about the resources there, or that. But actually, the resources I don't think there's that much resource to 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 warrant that kind of uh, uh, action. Uh, but uh, to my view, to my own view, that this kind of uh, obsession with the South China Sea territory is uh, part of the, um, uh, its project to revive its uh, Sinocentric tributary order. So because if uh, they absolutely established its uh, territorial claim over the South China Sea, that so it pushed all the way to the near the shoreline of Vietnam, Philippines, and Malaysia, then if this base is become a space exclusive for Chinese Navy and Chinese aircraft carrier and then US warship apart from being in that space, then you can imagine the relation of this Southeast Asian country with China will definitely change when you have Chinese warship like moving around freely uh, right off your shore. So the, the South China Sea is e eventually about the China relation with all these uh, laboring um, um, oceanic uh, littoral uh, uh, Southeast Asian state. Uh, and uh, you look at the uh, uh, so-called so Chinese IR theory discussion a few years back, the Tensa, the Heaven and Earth, that there's a famous book by Zhao Dingyang talk about this. We don't the Westphalia system is no good and everybody is selfish and self-centered, care about the national interest. We should have a kind of a Chinese traditional way of seeing the world with a concentric circle and then people ask who is at the center and then and then uh, people assume that uh, it is China but of course Zhao Dingyang revised his position uh, uh, when people ask and then oh no no I don't mean China need to be at the center it can be Europe it can be US it can be whoever but so far as it is a concentric circle that uh, that is good uh, and also there's a lot of um, these um, Chinese uh, political theorists who talk about this couch meat and, and, and all this kind of uh, 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 view of sovereignty and, and the talk about uh, revival of the Chinese Empire in a positive sense that that uh, uh, like Jiang Xigong in, in Beida, that, that he keep talking about this kind of uh, 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 Chinese empire in a positive sense, not a negative sense. So I, I, I'm not sure whether this ambivalent between the sovereignty talks and the tributary talk uh, is really an ambivalent. Or, where, or, or let me frame it as a question. Whether it is that really ambivalent that the Chinese leader has the lot make up their mind about whether they pay this rule of Westphalia, the ancient state, and with sovereignty. Um, or uh, reviving this tributary system, or the intention is always part of it is to reviving this tributary system. And, 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 and the, the Westphalia talk, the sovereignty talk, is just a kind of a cover up before they think that they are strong enough. That you look at the CCP relation with uh, the revolutionary movement in Southeast Asia, in Asia, that it is more like a tributary relation, that the Chinese Communist Party, the Malaysian Communist Party, the North Korean, and, and definitely. So, uh, so it is my, my question. And of course, there's another component that uh, in the, it is in the paper, but it is not mentioned in the presentation. It is that uh, the idea of Xi Jinping talk about Asia for Asians. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, is a copy, not copy, it's a repetition of the Japanese uh, Coast Prosperity Circle, that that is uh, uh, non Asian power outside the region has no right to to like interfere with Asian affairs. Let Asians settle the issues among Asians. So it is the uh, how the Japanese Empire when they try to exclude the American influence, the British influence, and then uh, make the whole Asia its spheres of influence. Uh, so basically, that Xi Jinping's uh, talk about Asia for Asians might uh, invoke people's memory about this and, and, and the, the co prosperity circle. So that's really the third legs of uh, kind of imagination about uh, Asian international relation. So it is, uh, there's a lot of more uh, if I have time, but uh, because of the limit of time, I have to move on to uh, the paper uh, by uh, Professor Huang Minhua and uh, Zhu Yunhan. And, and again, there's very solid empirical um, evidence uh, showing um, um, how the ups and downs of Asian countries' perception of China change with all these kind of variables. I have wrote this built about it, and it is uh, very solid and uh, very well grounded. And my question or comment is uh, mostly about, at the very end, you have this suggestion about what the Chinese government could do to make uh, di diplomatic relations smoother and less antagonistic within Asia. Uh, 
uh, they are very good suggestion. That my only question is uh, uh, how realistic it is. That because in in the kind of ideal world that the Chinese leader can um, look at this result and know, I know that if I do this A B C and then the Asian countries will be less suspicious of me and then the the people in Taiwan will be more welcoming and strong integration and things like that. Uh, but in reality, the Chinese leader not only lead to cater for the perception of their labor, but there's kind of internal consumption that connect to the Jing Sun paper that uh, uh, sometimes this kind of a nationalist talk or hawkish talk, uh, it, although they know that it is going to provoke the labor and then create a backlash from the US, but they still need to talk about this or talk like that because it is for internal consumption. That is uh, this kind of uh, invoke the nationalist uh, aspiration of the people so that uh, the people will see the CCP as a kind of a rightful defender of uh, national interest and uh, CCP is going to help us to take back what we lost over the last 150 years. So it is for internal legitimacy. Of course, that this kind of internal talk, in, internal audience and external audience, there's always a kind of um, uh, dilemma. And then uh, how you balance the two is a really very, very, very uh, difficult task. Uh, an example that I can think of is that this disaster about this Made in China 2025 thing that uh, it is very nationalistic. I don't think uh, uh, it intend to scare US and other foreign countries about Chinese intention to catch up. I, I really believe that the original intention of all this the uh, high level war, the main China 2025 thing is for internal consumption. But uh, from external perspective, it is a very silly thing to do because you tell the people that by 2025, China is going to master all this technology. And then while people in engineering and science field, they know that there's no way that they can really autonomously gather this knowledge. And, and, and you must, uh, in that short span of time, that the only way, realistic way for you to really achieve this 2025 goal is to technolo through technology transfer, or AKA from a US perspective, stealing. And uh, so basically from internal consumption is very good. People think that China is becoming a high-tech power, but from external perspective, it is very bad PR, not only PR, but uh, the real practical uh, uh, consequences that it is like a laundry list of what you are going to steal, that to tell the world that it is what we are going to steal. That, that it is very bad, that uh, I'm cynical. I'm, I, I'm not making very judgment about this technology transfer thing, but even if you are okay with this technology transfer and stealing, it is still very silly to enlarge the list of things that you are going to steal. Uh, before you actually do it, do it silently. Uh, <laughs> if you really want to do it. <laughs> I'm not sure other latecomers have been doing it silently, but definitely for the Chinese case, that, that it is very bad strategy or PR or whatever. But for internal consumption, it really makes people think that they're great. So this, this dilemma between external and internal consumption is really, really important. That, uh, and of course, and for internally, that now China, what is going on in Xinjiang and all Uyghurs concentration camp, it, 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 it do bad PR, particularly for China relation with other Muslim country. That uh, Turkish and Pakistan, because of economic interest, that they don't want to say too much about it. And, but but uh, among the people within the country, that is definitely unease about this closing relation with, with, with their own country and China, given the situation of the Muslim there. And again, that uh, of course, that, that China uh, will win more friends among the Muslim country if uh, uh, the Muslims in Xinjiang situation can improve. Maybe the concentration camp can uh, they, they stop it, for example. But for internally, that again, that uh, maybe the leader think that it is a necessity to do it for internal stability or whatever. So again, this all these um, kind of issues uh, involve um, uh, the balance and the calculus between external audience and internal audience. And it seems that, uh, and in the morning that we discussed the fact that uh, Xi Jinping in the beginning, that uh, uh, Professor Wu would remind us that in the beginning of Xi was a very weak leader. So he really led to, uh, to portray himself as a kind of a real big power uh, in the world stage in order to improve his standing uh, among the rival elite factions and the people. So it is for internal calculation is driving all this externally looking for a bad kind of uh, talk and, and behavior. So, so, so my question is that uh, as of 2019, then how realistic it is? Or even if it is not realistic, 
that China will adopt this proposal to soften its image, is there any chance that in the years down the road that, that China could, could change it? Or we are going down the road of Xi Jinping being very aggressive, uh, not caring the backlash, but only for internal consumption. So I, probably I had to stop here and then uh, let other people uh, come in and, and raise their question. Thank you.